I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to say to your neighbor, today is going to be life-changing for you. Your life is never going to be the same again. You want to know why I said that? Oh, I didn't tell you not to repeat that, did I? But do you know why, don't repeat this, but do you know why I say that? I say that through faith because I just believe the Word of God. It's the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of Almighty God. God says what He means, and He means what He says. God has great things in store for you. Did you know that? God has great things in store for me. God has great things in store for us. We were born victorious. Now we've just got to walk it out. We, we were born to be victorious people. I think, I think it was Shasta that said it earlier, that we're the head and not the tail. We're, we're above and not beneath. We're blessed and highly favored of Almighty God. Listen to this. The greatest obstacle standing between you and your goals, your dreams, your destiny, your calling, your purpose in life, <clears throat> and you going to the next level is fear. The greatest obstacle standing between you and your dreams is not the person next to you. The greatest obstacle standing between you and your dreams, your goals, your destiny. How many of you know that all of us have a calling on our life? Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not, not everybody's called to be a police officer. Not everybody's called to be a, te a, a teacher. But everybody has a calling on their life. Everybody is important to God. The same anointing that's up on me is the same anointing that's up on you. But the greatest obstacle standing between all of that stuff, standing between you and your calling, standing between your purpose in life, standing between you going to the next level is fear. The fear of failure. The fear of making mistakes. I think it was John Maxwell said that the greatest mistake that we make is living in fear that we'll make one. Living in fear that we'll make one. Anybody ever been there? You didn't want to do certain things because you were afraid of messing up. You, you were afraid of it, it collapsing right in front of you. I see some hands waving right now. I was one of those people. And I'm still attacked by that from time to time. But the fear of failure, the fear of making mistakes, the fear of coming up short, Anybody ever felt like, man, I want to do it, but I just don't want to come up short. Man, I just, I just, I don't want to blow it. So I'm going to play it safe and stay right here where I'm at. The fear of being denied. I think we've all been denied of certain things, haven't we? The fear of being rejected. The fear of being humiliated. The fear of being laughed at. The fear of falling flat on your face. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that you don't need to plan, prepare, count the cost, or live recklessly. But what I am saying is, so what? So what if you fail? So what if you make a mistake? So what if you come up short? So what if you get denied? So what if you get rejected? So what if you get humiliated? So what if you get laughed at? So what if you fall on your face? At least you made the attempt by taking a step of faith. So what if you come up short? Who cares? That's how you grow. That's how you develop. That's how you become more mature, by learning from your mistakes. And just because you come up short don't mean you failed. Just because you come up short doesn't mean you failed. Turn to your neighbor and say, so what? You guys remember when you were kids when somebody said something and you didn't like it, you would say, so what? Well, look at the popsicle I got. So what? Look at the popsicle I got. It's got a cherry on top. Well, we need to say to the devil when he says, you're going to fail, you're going to mess up, you're going to blow it. So what? Let me hear you say it. Well, put another O on it. Go ahead. Oh, y'all put too many on there. I said one, y'all put six. That's all right. We get the point, though, right? Don't you know that you have an enemy out there that's come to steal, kill, and destroy? God's put dreams inside of you, but the enemy wants to steal them. 
with fear. He wants to paralyze you. He wants to destroy the dream that God has placed on the inside of you. A song we used to sing in the church I grew up in, Victory is Mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. You, you don't have to wait until you see it. You can, begin to, you can begin shouting victory right here and right now. But the devil says you're going to mess up. People are going to laugh at you. You're going to be humiliated if you don't do what you said you're going to do, if it don't turn out the way you want it to turn out. What if it don't turn out the way you want to? So what? What if you do fail? What if it collapses right in front of you? What if people laugh at you? What if you get denied? A little bit louder. What if you get rejected? So what? Listen, why do we listen to the enemy when we should be listening to Almighty God? Why do we listen? I say we because I've been there, done that. I, I, I'll be the first to tell you. God has put something in my heart, and before you know it, I'll just listen to it. What if this happens? What if that happens? And the devil says, well, you know, if you do this, that's going to happen, and you, and you just better not do it. And before you know it, I will forget about what God said, and I will listen to the liar of all lies, the father of all lies, and don't do it. Anybody ever been there? I've got some great news for you. The next time God puts something in your heart and the devil feeds you a whole bunch of lies, you need to tell him, I love it. We will never, ever reach our full potential in God, nor in life, until we overcome the fear of failure. You will never become the person that God wants you to become. You will never reach your goals in life until we overcome the fear of failure. Overcoming the fear of failure does not mean that you will never encounter fear again. What it does mean is that it will no longer be a dictator in your life. In fact, some of your greatest accomplishments in life will take place right in the face of fear. Some of your victories are going to take place while fear is staring you in the eyeballs. Now, I've heard people say for years, if you don't have peace about it, don't do it. Well, I believe that's only partially true because you're going to have to do some things while fear is right there. You're not going to always have that ooey gooey chill bump feeling all over you. You're going to have to take a step of faith while you are afraid. But in the midst of being afraid, know that God is with you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? <laughs> Overcoming the fear of failure does not mean that you will never encounter fear again. That's just not life. That's just not a fact. That's just not true. I wish that you could pray one time and fear would leave you forever. But that just doesn't happen. Have you ever got a phone call from a telemarketer and you tell them, don't put me on the don't call list, and you get another call from another telemarketer? And sometimes even, see, they got slick now because now when you try to tell them, will you please put me on your don't call list, they'll hang up before you can get it all out. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. Now, I've tried over the years to be nice to those folks. I'll wait for them to take a breath just to tell them, I'm, I'm not interested, please put me They don't take a breath. I don't know how, it's a miracle. They don't take a breath. So you're sitting there waiting and waiting for them to take a breath, and it never happens. But see, the, don't call, the, 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 the telemarketers keep on calling. The enemy is going to keep on coming. The enemy is going to keep on pressing. But greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. God has given us dominion. God has given us authority. God has given us power over every demonic spirit that would try to put fear on the inside of you. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, 
but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But just because God hasn't given it to us doesn't mean the enemy won't attack us with it. It's going to come. You see, what you may or may not know is that you're a part of a ministry that almost never existed. You're sitting in some seats right now that you almost didn't have an opportunity to sit in. Due to the fear of failure, around 2006, God began to speak to me about planting a church that would be something fresh, something alive, and something on fire for him. God said that this new church plant would be a church where people from different races would be able to come together under one roof and worship him together regardless of denomination. God said that this new church plant would be a church where people would be, would be saved, renew their relationship with him in a place where those that have messed up morally, ethically, and spiritually could come and be restored and used again by him and do might and, great thing, might and great things in the kingdom of God. Is that happening? Those were the things that God told me. Here are the things that the devil told me not long after I heard from the voice of Almighty God. Number one, the devil said, you're too young and nobody, you're too young to be anybody's pastor. Who's going to want to listen to what you have to say? You're just a kid. Some of those people will be old enough to be your parents. Do you really think they're going to respect you? Do you really think you can teach them a thing or two? That's what the enemy told me. Second thing the enemy said was, you're not good enough. You're not qualified to be a pastor. Third thing he says, hardly nobody knows you. Therefore, nobody's going to even show up to the first service. Don't even waste your time. Let that little dream of yours die. Things that could have aborted the ministry within the first year. I hope you know that new church plants typically die within the first 12 to 18 months. Do you guys want to hear the things that, that, that happened that could have aborted the ministry from within the first year? Listen to this. We planted the church in 2008, which was during one of the worst economical times in the history of our country. But I didn't have enough sense to realize that. <laughs> that was a blessing. That was one of the worst times in our country's history was 2008, which was when we planted the House of Restoration. Who would have ever guessed it? Businesses all over the U.S. were shutting down. Countless businesses were, were closing their doors. I'm sorry, countless businesses that weren't closing their doors were forced to permanently lay people off. Whirlpool was one of those places. Latrice and I were not sent from another church to plant ours with finances to back it up and help us to follow, which meant we had no money. We had zero dollars. We had our own dollars, but we didn't have any money to plant a church, and we weren't sent from another church. A, a lot of church plants, successful church plants, are sent out from another church, and, and they, have, they have money to go with it, and, and they have people that would go and help them get that church started. And then those people that help them, they will either stay there or go back to the mother church. We didn't have no people to go with us. And we didn't have no money to go with us. All we had was me, myself, and I. We had 11 people in our living room. Roxy and, well, we had more than 11 smart adults besides the kids. Roxy and Pettit. Uh, I'm trying to think who all was here today. Dana, Tasha. Well, Dana Tasha's not in here, but they were with us. Eleven people in our living room. That's it. We didn't have thousands of dollars. We, we didn't have a building that was established for us. We didn't have people to come and, and, and play the keyboard like, like, like Angela does. And we, did, we didn't have all that stuff. We didn't have ushers and grits. So with those eleven people, guess what I did? Okay, this is what you're going to do. When people come and you give them a bulletin, say, welcome to the House of Restoration. And this is what you're going to do. You, I cast vision to those 11 people. And God took those 11 people, including us, and he brought some great and wonderful things out of it. 
but we didn't have money to get started. That could have killed us from the very beginning. Here's some things that, that could have discouraged us greatly and caused us to throw in the towel. I'm talking about overcoming fear. Things that could have greatly discouraged us and caused us to throw in the towel. Number one, since Latrice and I had no money to start a ministry, we had to raise it our own. And I had never raised a penny in my life. Some people are really good about raising money. Some people are just really good. Some people can walk up to a person that's only got $100 and they can get that $100. I'd be too embarrassed to ask them. I'd be too scared to ask them for half of it. Some people have that gift. Tashayla didn't have that gift. Tashayla wasn't used to asking people for nothing. Tashayla had been in the ministry for seven years, evangelizing, doing everything by my lonesome. Now, all of a sudden, God, you want me to do what? Where? Plant a church? God, where the money going to come from? We had to raise the money ourselves. Listen to this. The very first person we went to, to Vision Cast, was a very successful businessman. Some of you guys have heard this story before. Very successful businessman. Drove up to the house, lived in a big, beautiful two-story house. Drove a brand new candy apple red Corvette. When I pulled up to his house, I saw dollar signs. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've preached in his church before. did a pretty good job. You know what I mean? So, so I walk up and I began to share my vision with him and said, we're going to start a church, yada, yada, yada. And I said, I'm just wondering, would you be willing to sow into our ministry? He said, absolutely, I will. He went in the house. He said, I'll be right back. Went in his house, came back out, and he put some paper in my hand. So you know me. I, I stuck it in my pocket. I didn't want to look at, the, look at the money right in front of the man. Get out of his eyesight first, right? <laughs> Listen, this guy had a long driveway. So I got this money in my pocket. So here's to Shayla's thoughts. See, y'all are too spiritual. I mean, y'all, y'all, are, y'all are godly folks. I'm in the flesh. I'm going to be real with you. I'm wanting to know what's in my pocket. How many thousands of dollars is this in my pocket? Because we need a thousand of dollars, right? So I'm going down this long driveway. How many of you guys think I looked at the money before I got to the end of the driveway? Or do you think I waited until I got back to Fort Smith like a godly man should? Well, don't look at me what you think I did. <laughs> you ain't got no faith in your pastor. <laughs> listen, y'all wrong anyway. Y'all, I didn't, listen, I didn't even get halfway. <laughs> Forget the end. I'm probably a couple of wheels turns away from him, and I'm digging in my pocket. $40. What'd you say, Roxy? That's exactly what I did. I said, God, I thank you for this $40. See? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. And... See, what I didn't tell y'all was a few weeks prior to that, the Holy Spirit said to me while I was cutting the grass, despise not small beginnings. I said, God, what do you mean by despise not small beginnings? What what do you mean by, I knew what that meant, but I didn't know what he meant by saying that to me. He never responded. About a a few days later or a week later, God says again, despise not small beginnings. God, what does that mean? He didn't tell me. But when I got that $40 and I looked at it, the Holy Spirit said for the third time, despise not small beginnings. I put that $40 right back where it came from and said, God, I thank you for this $40. After that, after that, we began to get checks for $2,000, a check for $1,000, checks for five. We raised $15,000. And that sounds like a whole lot of money, but in reality, it's not. But $15,000 was a whole lot of money for a Tashayla who had never raised a dime in his life. But that was a moment that could have caused us to throw in the towel. You get $40 from a rich man. Well, at least it looked like he was rich. $40. Now, in the natural, be honest now, in, in the natural, if God hadn't have spoke to me prior, I probably would have said, man, you tightwad. 
it costs more than $40 to fill up your Corvette. <laughs> you can't even buy a vacuum cleaner with $4, $40. Oh, I'm, I'm the only one who would have said that. <laughs> Our very first service, we had over 200 people that showed up. Of course, several of those were well-wishers. Everybody come to your first service, they ain't coming back for the second. That They come to wish you well. They come to support you. I'm here to celebrate with you. Within that 200 people, you got some nosy folks. They want to come and see what things look like and see how things, let's just keep it real. You got some nosy folks that will show up in your church, and then you got some that want to see you fail. That's why you show them Jesus. You know what I mean? 200 people showed up. The second service, let me tell you something. Let, let me back up. Our first service, we walked out of, we walked out of my office about 10.15. Walked to my office about 10.15. Come from the back, walk up to the front, just like I'm doing right now. And I sat in this chair right here, well, sit on the front row. When I walked out, how many people do you think was there? <laughs> first service, 200 people at 10.15. Second service, and for you, you that know, don't say nothing. How many guys think, Anna, you guys don't know. How many people do you think the second service was? 50. Who said 50? 50 people. How many people do you think? 20. Old vow. <laughs> Old vow of little faith. I got to get away from Anna. <clears throat> His answer sounded better, 50. Who else wants to guess? How many people do you think was our second service at 10.15? We started at 10.30. 10.50, how many people? 200. Who said 200? 200. 40. 40. One more. 70. Who said 70? 70 people. Wrong. <laughs> it's about 30 people. About 30 people, that second service that we came out... First service at 10.15, we had over 200 people in there. Second service, about 30 people. My heart sank. I came up here on the front row, and Roxy had tried to go through the motions of, of worshiping God. I'm looking at Roxy because she was with us. Trying to go through the motions of worshiping God, but I'm thinking, where are these people at? started this church and they kept their behinds at the house. 30 people. God, what you doing? Praise and worship is over with. I get up here on the stage, turn around, and I was like, where'd he come from? By then it was about 80 people. But I didn't have enough sense to realize that 80 people for a new church plant was pretty doggone good. But that was something that could have caused us to become discouraged and throw in the towel. About six months after we launched, we were notified by the landlord that they no longer wanted to lease the building to us. They wanted to sell it. And that facility was, I think, around $800,000. How many of you know that there's not a bank in the world in their right minds going to loan a church of six months almost a million dollars? So now here we are. I got to get in front of the tell the church, listen, we got to get out of here. We, we got to relocate. And that was hard to do. A lot of stuff that we saw was more than what we could afford. The old Best Buy. You guys know where the old Best Buy used to be? How much do you think that was a month? Too much. <laughs> $20,000 a month. Y'all heard me? Not a year. A month, 20000 bucks. The old Michaels on Rogers Avenue, $6,000 or, or $8,000 a month. The place in, in the quarry shopping center where the uh, Halloween stuff comes uh, yearly, $6,000 a month. We ain't had no $6,000 a month. Who <laughs> Think we T.D. Jakes or somebody? <laughs> My name T T.D. all right, it ain't no Jakes. But that was something that could have caused us to throw in 
the towel. Someone say, but. But today, I proudly stand before each of you to say that the House of Restoration is the largest multicultural church in Fort Smith, Arkansas, where the pastor is black, and we have just as many white members as we do black. <laughs> Glory to Almighty God. Glory to Almighty God. I said 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 glory to Almighty God. And, and if you wonder why I'm so excited about that, it's because this is what heaven is going to look like. Heaven is not going to be segregated based upon your skin color, but we're going to all be worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So why not start here right now? Virtually on a weekly basis, people are coming to the house of restoration and to the altar to give their hearts to Jesus and to rededicate their lives back to God. On a yearly basis, our church supports a church in South Africa which feeds and clothes people on a weekly basis. In addition, unfortunately, babies are born with AIDS. And those mothers abandon those babies on the side of the road and in trash cans. Pastor Collins is the pastor that I'm talking about, where when you and I faithfully tithe, by you and I faithfully tithing, our church faithfully tithes. And with that fi those finances, we support other ministries. One of them is in South Africa where they feed people on a weekly basis, where they clothe people on a weekly basis, where they take those, those newborn babies that were left on the side of the road and they will find a place for those babies to go. It's because you and I are faithful to the tithe covenant. But yet, it almost didn't exist because of the fear of failure. Yes, I was afraid of it failing. Yes, I felt like, well, what if, it don't, what if it doesn't work? I had people tell me to my face, are you serious? You're going to leave Whirlpool and you're going to start a church? What if nobody shows up? You've got great benefits at Whirlpool. You've got a great job. So what? <laughs> you must be the pastor's wife. You mean to tell me that you're going to walk away from your job, don't have no money to start it, don't know where you're going to go? Yeah, because God told me so. The devil lied, but I'm going to listen to God. On a yearly basis, our church financially supports a church in Czech Republic. You met the pastor last sun uh, Sunday before last, Pastor Stan which is considered to be the most atheistic country on the globe. Our finances help them spread the gospel to those hell-bound people. That's what this church does. On a monthly basis, right here in our own backyard, our church financially supports the community rescue mission, which feeds, clothes, and houses homeless and those going through rough times. On a monthly basis, we financially support a ministry called WE, World Evangelism, which uh, which trains pastors and leaders around the world, as well as assist in aiding in catastrophes both nationally and internationally. Internationally, on, on a monthly basis, we financially support Samaritan's Purse, which is a ministry headed by Franklin Graham, the son of Dr. Billy Graham, that also assists in aiding people in natural disasters. On a sometimes weekly basis, just depends on the situation. We also support people right here in this very church that goes through financial problems, lost a job, got laid off, whatever the case might be, where their electric bill is going to get turned off, their gas bill is going to get turned off. They might get evicted because of this house and because of your faithfulness to the tithe covenant 
We're able to help those people. God in his infinite wisdom took this young black man, kid, that the enemy said was too young to pastor a church that don't know anything, that's not qualified, and put a dream inside of his heart. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. God put something inside of my heart that I can't even put into words today fully to help you understand. But about two years ago, when, when all of this, the Confederate flag stuff was going on and when, when police officers were shooting people and, and a big racial stir, racial stink was stirred up. It, it, was, it was, I could feel it right here in Fort Smith. Uh, we, we could also see the situation with Southside High School where they, where they removed the Dixie song and they, they moved the, the rebel flag and all that kind of stuff. It caused a lot of racial stink. Right here in Fort Smith, I could feel the stink. I could feel the, the, the racial tension. I could feel it. I could see it. And not long afterwards, in July of that same year, 12 police officers in, in Dallas were ambushed and five were killed. See, something that you may or may not know is that I am a volunteer police chaplain right here in Fort Smith, Arkansas have always had a love for police officers. Grew up as a kid desiring to become a police officer, but God had a better, not a better, but God had another plan. Not a better. Not a, not a better. God had a, another plan. But yet I still had this yearning in my heart to love those men and women in uniform. Those people that are willing to go behind those doors, not knowing what's on the other side, and sometimes knowing what's on the other side. And then when all kinds of mess break loose, when everybody's fleeing to safety, they're fleeing to harm and danger. I got up on a Monday morning and I said to Latrice, I wonder why one of the well-named, well-known, well-seasoned, Household name pastors in our community hasn't called together a citywide prayer gathering of Christian churches. Forget the denomination. Forget the fact that we're different skin tones. But the common denominator is J E S U S. The common denominator is Jesus. Look at the power that would be in the house if we could all come together. Forget about whether you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues. Forget about whether you wear makeup or you don't wear makeup. Forget about the fact that you think it's wrong to eat pork or not eat pork. I'm going to eat pork and still praise Jesus. <laughs> that was free right there, y'all. See, the enemy wants to use denominations to divide the body of Christ. But yet we still come all from the same risen Lord. But why hasn't, why hasn't one of these well-known pastors, somebody with influence, you know how we think, somebody that you just say, hey, let's get together on such and such date at 6 o'clock. Okay, we'll be there. See, my thoughts were they'll listen to them before they listen to me because they know him. They, they, everybody knows him. Just as quickly as I said that, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, that hasn't happened because it's not their assignment. It's yours. It's yours. Listen, you ever seen a commercial or a cartoon where, where the little cartoon character just, just automatically, he just stands up straight or he, he just instantly something on the inside of me began to well up. Some excitement that I can't, passion that I can't explain. Latrice and I went to the office that day. We didn't know how to do this. We didn't know what to do. To our knowledge, it's never happened in our city before. How in the world do you get all these churches together under one roof? How do you contact them? You don't have their information. Google. Christian churches in Fort Smith, they spit out over 100 names. Not every pastor is full-time at a church. There are a lot of them that are by vocational, so a lot of them didn't even answer the office phone and couldn't afford a secretary. I'm, I'm thankful to God we got a good secretary at our church. 
Sometimes I'm that secretary. <laughs> but those times I'm not, Latrice says. But you know, we are blessed. You are blessed. We are blessed that God has blessed us financially towards I can shepherd the flock full time. We Googled. They spent over 100 names. So, man, we're calling. Latrice is in her office. I'm in my. We calling. We calling. Not, hardly nobody's answering. So we leave a message on the answer machine. I said, Latrice, we'll be here for a month of Sundays trying to do this. Let's put those same numbers that we Googled, and let's just put them on. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll write out the vision, put it in the mail, and we'll just send it to them. The first city on our knees prayer gathering that we had was at ET. Standing room only. Over 1,100 people showed up to that prayer gathering. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was in that place in a very supernatural way, but it almost didn't happen because the house of restoration almost didn't happen due to the fear of failure. What's on hold in your life today? What's at a standstill in your life today due to the fear of failure? Are you no longer walking in your calling? Have you not answered your call to the Spirit of God? Or have you no longer, have you no longer answered, or have you not answered your call to God? Are you setting on fear? The fear of failure. What if it doesn't work? God, I don't know what to do. Well, guess what? I didn't know what to do either, but God showed me. God will never call you to something that he will not direct you to. God will never call you to do something that he will not guide you and lead you. That would make him look bad. I've made some mistakes in the ministry. I've made some, some no-nos. I've, 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 I've made some mess-ups. So what? Pick your big boy britches on and keep on moving. Mistakes don't justify, mistakes don't, um, they don't control who you are. M mistakes don't define who, there's my word define. Mistakes don't, y'all knew I was trying to find that word, huh? Y'all should have helped me. Define, pastor. Mistakes don't define who you are. They develop who you are. They give you character. They help shape you. They help make you. They help mold you. But man, we fight so hard not to make them. If you can find one man in the Bible outside of Jesus that never made a mistake, I'll show you a person that doesn't know what they're talking about. Because there's not a person in the Bible, there's not a person walking the face of the earth that, are, that have ever walked the face of the earth outside of Jesus that's not ever made a mistake. It's not the mistakes that kill you. It's not the mistakes that destroy you. It's the fear of thinking you're going to make them, therefore you never even start. How many lives can be touched and transformed just with you? Carrying out your purpose. What does God call you to do? Where's your destiny? Where's the next level in your life? Is it on a shelf somewhere? Have you forgotten about it? Is it full of dust right now? Is it buried somewhere deep in the ground? Rotten away. God can use anybody. I close with this right here. How do you overcome the fear of failure? I think we're going to have it up on the screen. It should be the last point. How do you overcome the fear? How do you overcome the fear of failure? That's a good question, right? How do you overcome this monster right here? Now, the answer might surprise you. The answer might shock you, and you might even disagree with the answer. You overcome the fear of failure when you bury the spirit of pride. You 
Overcome the fear of failure when you bury the spirit of pride. Can I tell you the essence of all of that? Listen, this church almost didn't exist because I was afraid of flopping. I was afraid of failure. I was afraid I'd look like a fool. I was afraid it wouldn't work. I, I, I. Where's God in that? I, I, I. That's where some of you are today. You're so afraid because everything is centered around you. I'm not telling you not to count the cost. Only a fool would not count the cost. Only a fool wouldn't prepare and use wisdom, get godly counsel. But we overcome the fear of failure when we take our eyes off of us and place them on Almighty God. I want to stop right now. I want to ask the question, how many of you have been blessed by this ministry? If you have, stand up on your feet. In any kind of way you've been blessed by this ministry, please stand up on your feet. If, if you've been blessed in any way by this ministry, stand up on your feet. Now, for those of you that are in front, I want you to turn around and look at all the people standing behind you. Hardly a person in here is sitting down. We've got some guests, first-time guests. Y'all stick around. Y'all going to be blessed by this ministry. You may be seated. See, because of the pride that I didn't realize was that that was hidden beneath the surface almost caused me to get in the way of your blessing. You almost didn't show up in this building because of the fear of failure that took place back in 2006 or whenever it was. I'll never forget, I was riding down Rogers Avenue not long after we started the church. And I had this thought, God, I'm going to stand before you one day and give an account for how I've conducted myself, give an account for how I've led this church. And it occurred to me, to Shayla, where would these people be if you hadn't been obedient to the call of God on your life? Would they be sheep just wandering in the wilderness? Would those that were on drugs still be on drugs, but maybe deeper in that mess? Would those that have low self-esteem be even worse than what they were? Would those that were hell-bound, that have died since you knew them, be in hell right now? But because they came to the house, and found Jesus, gave their heart to Jesus, or rededicated their life in the presence of Almighty God. See, I had you to stand up for a reason. How many people are waiting on you to overcome the fear of failure and step out on faith? Fulfill your purpose. Fulfill your destiny. Answer the call of God on your life. Maybe it's not to preach. Maybe it's to start a business. But you're afraid it won't succeed. If God be for you, who can be against you? But God, I don't, God, I don't know how to run a business. I didn't know how to run a church. Some of y'all might say I still don't. <laughs> That's between you and God. What about that business you're supposed to start? What about that ministry that you're supposed to start? You're anointed. You're gifted. You're blessed and highly favored of God. The favor of God is up on you. It's time for you to take a step of faith and be about the Father's business. And I'm not just looking at you because I'm preaching, but I'm looking at you, talking directly to you. It's time for you to answer the call of God that's on your life. And fulfill your purpose. Everything that's needed, God will provide. 
The entire puzzle is not going to be put together until you step out. And then it goes in one piece at a time. God said to me before we ever launched this ministry, God said, I'm going to send you seasoned people that will help you. Seasoned saints that will help you. I will send God, I will send God, what am I going to do, God? How am I going to start a church? Because I took my eyes off of God and placed them on church that's been around for a thousand years. They had the praise and worship team. They had Bob Ferguson's. They had kids. They had all of that stuff. They had the media team. You know what I had? Nothing. This was before we started having our pre-launch services where Roxy and, and Pettit and the others came in and, and grabbed hold of the vision. But I'm sitting and saying, God, how am I going to do this? God said, it's not how you're going to do it. It's how I'm going to do it through you. I'll never forget, I was sitting in the bathroom one evening on the floor, leaning up against the tub. I better be careful with that. Sitting on the floor, leaning up against the tub, having a pity. Anybody ever had a pity party? Anybody? Lift your hand if you had a pity party. How about a scary pity party? You scared half to death. Not scared, you scared. <laughs> Difference between scared and scared. The phone rings, and it's a good friend of ours, Belva Rawls. Some of you guys may know as Belva Graham. Anybody know Belva? Mighty woman of God. She calls me, and, and, and God, whatever reason, God wants to talk to folks about me, you know what I mean? She said, Pastor, I just want you to know, and I wasn't even a pastor at that time, but she referred to me as pastor. She had no clue what was going on inside of my life as far as what God had put on my heart. She said, Pastor, I just want to encourage you you need to do what you know God has called you to do. Now, I like to pick, how many of you guys are analyzers? Of course you ain't going to raise your hand. I analyze things sometimes. So I wanted to see where she was headed with this. I said, what, what, what are you, I'm playing dumb, y'all. What do you mean? You know what I mean. God is calling, calling you to raise up a church in our city. Wow. She said, Tashayla, let me tell you something. Do you want me to tell you what the problem is? Blew my mind. She said, the problem is pride. Now, I took that kind of personal. I, I really did. Now, I didn't tell her that until months later. I took that kind of, that offended me because she said I was being prideful. I'm thinking, how in the world am I being prideful? I want to do the right thing. I, I want to make sure that, that I'd accomplish what God has called me to accomplish. I'm counting the cost. I'm trying to give myself, I'm trying to make it sound right. You know what I mean? Oh, but was she right? It was pride. Because I was trying to figure out how I was going to do it. Not that I wanted the glory, but I wasn't trusting God. God said, I'm going to send you seasoned saints that will help you in the ministry. And let me tell you, he's done it. And he's doing it. Two of them, there are, there are more than two, but specifically two of them are, are in the audience right now. There's a woman here right now that we started in 2008, so September this year will be 10 years. There's a woman in our congregation right now that prophesied over me about 12 or 13 years ago. And said, God is going to raise you up to lead a powerful ministry. She said, stay humble. I can't remember the, all the words, but she said, stay humble. But God is going to raise you up to lead a powerful ministry. That was about two or three years before we ever started. At this point in time, God hadn't even spoke to me about the house of restoration. She may have known it, maybe she didn't. But in my mind, little did that woman know that she would be a part of the prophetic word that was uttered from her lips that came from the Father. Anna, I want you to stand up. This is the woman right here. Go ahead and stand, Ben. 
This is the woman right here that prophesied over my life when we were going to harvest time on a Wednesday night and spoke those things over me. I will never forget the look on her face. She had me to turn around and she symbolically put a cloak or a covering, whatever it was, over me. You remember that? <laughs> cloak of humility. Don't become prideful. And now God is honoring his word by sending us, and he's been doing it, seasoned saints to help us in the ministry. Some of you are in the, con in the, in the audience right now. I'm just talking about these two because they're fairly new to our, our church. They come the last couple of months, I guess. Won't go into details, but something you don't know. Before God transitioned you from where you were to where you are, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about it, told my wife about it. Is that the honest God's truth? I said, I know where they're going. Where? The house of restoration. How do I know? Because the same God that spoke to her was the same God that spoke to me. Amen. Welcome to the house. With that being said, Anna, do, do you want to share anything or are you, you good? You, you want to share anything about that? Let me get the mic if you do. It's, Latrice, will you give that, will you give that mic to, to Anna? This wasn't planned. She didn't expect to speak, so. I just remember that night. And uh, we were to pray for others. And um, <clears throat> a lot of times when you prophesy for someone, you don't remember what you say, you know, because the Lord is talking through you. And so you will prophesy for, over someone and uh, they'll say, remember when you told me this or you remember when you told me that? I remember every word <laughs> wow. of that night. And I went to him and I found him and he was talking to someone else. And I said, to Shayla, you... you are going to, the Lord is going to build a mighty church through you. A big church. A, a mega church. Wow. And I said, now turn around. And I put the cloak of humility on him. And I said, don't ever take it off. Yeah. Ever take it off. And I don't think he has. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I want to say this, and I've already closed a couple of times, but I want to say this. Something that I've been thinking about here lately, Anna, you said a mega church. I think about the church. Because I sense in my spirit that God is doing something new in our city. See, this, this mega church may not be in the sense of what we think about a mega church as far as Bishop Jake's church or something like that with, with 20,000 people and all of that. But I think it's even larger. I think it's even larger. Let me tell you why I think it's even larger. Because I think it's the Baptist church and the Pentecostal church and the Assemblies of God church and this church and that church and this church and that church and that church and that church and that church. where they say, you know, we, we may not see eye to eye on everything, but we see eye to eye that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He died for our sins and He resurrected from the grave. He is returning again. And if we can put all of those differences to the side and come together as one, we can make a greater difference in the city of Fort Smith and we can spread abroad. That's kingdom work right there. You're going to fail. So what? You're going, to be, you're going to get denied. So what? You're going to get rejected. So what? You're going to fall on your face. So what? You're going to get laughed at. So what? Jesus was laughed at. So what? And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords.
real quickly, how do we overcome the fear of failure? Put your pride to the side and trust Jesus. That's what it all boils down to. It's that little bitty hidden thing. When we think of pride, we think of being puffed up because that's what tricked me. I thought she was saying I was being arrogant, but I wasn't being arrogant. I was just focused on Tashayla. See, it's the current that drowns people. You can't even see the current. It's beneath. And logs are under there and rocks and all kinds of mess. And you don't see that. It's the undercurrent that drowns people. It takes them down the river. Sometimes pride in that form you don't even see that will choke the life right out of you. Every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around. God, I have preached this morning from the depths of my heart. I have proclaimed the word of Almighty God. And Lord, I know that this word is a life-giving word. And Lord, I know without a shadow of a doubt that for a word like this to come forth, there must be people in this room that are in need of that word. And Lord, I just believe that you're trying to raise up some people in this house. I believe, Father God, you're trying to help them or you're going to help them overcome the fear of failure. But Father, they're going to do that by taking their eyes off of themselves and placing them upon you. They're going to take their eyes off of their inabilities and place them upon your abilities, oh God. They're going to take their eyes off of where they're limited and place their eyes on where you are limitless. You can do all things. And Lord, I just declare that today is a day of victory. For those that have been walking in fear, that they will stand today and say, no longer will I allow this dictator called fear to rule my life, but only the spirit of the living God in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around.